Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Empty Quiver. Everything archery related and a little more. Proudly sponsored by Tethered, Vantage Point Archery and Darton Archery. John Lusk, welcome to The Empty uh, Quiver podcast, buddy. You're looking good and that's an impressive backdrop you got going on there. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It's like a fake background that I just put on there. You know, when I do stuff with, with, I work as a pastor, I do stuff with my ministry. I got to blur my background. Ah, uh, yeah. Because some people don't like it, but I sure like it. Yeah. 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 No, that's cool. Does, do, like, overall, would you say that churchgoers are hunting supporters? Like, I always kind of felt like they're quite connected to that sort of stuff. You know, I would say it's probably, probably, 30% would be really enthusiastically supportive, maybe uh -huh. 50% neutral, like yeah, they're not okay. negative. They're just like, oh, okay, whatever. And then yeah. maybe there's like 20, 10, 20% that are just like, how can a man of God be killing animals? Like yeah. <laughs> there's but, some people that are really offended. But isn't there something in the, like, I'm not religious at all and I don't know, but I thought there was something in the Bible about it being like, all that stuff for, for us to use from God or something, isn't it? Or am yeah. I just make, am yeah. I making that up? The angel of the Lord told Peter in the New Testament, get up, kill, and eat. And man, I've been obeying that passage like year on end. Like, yeah. I love that command. Yeah. yeah. And, I mean, it's, and, and it's kind of funny too, as you would think holistically too, that if they, you know, believing in the Bible and, and the whole way it all works, that it was all there for that purpose. You know what I mean? Like, uh, that's how I would have thought too. We're just another predator really. Uh, or, yeah. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, yeah but anyway, fault. it is what it is, and everyone's got different opinions, and that's what yeah. makes it everything so wonderful, right? <laughs> right, uh, yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> so, um, we we'll just quickly, we've got a couple of things we always do here. So, um, I'm hoping most people know who you are, John, and what you do, but just do a quick introduction to yourself, and also after that, run us through what your bow setup is at the moment. So. Uh, just yeah. give you a little background about yourself and things. Okay, so I, I work as a pastor. That's my full-time gig. But I have an undergraduate degree in civil engineering mm. as well. And so then I grew up as an archer and a bow hunter. Both my parents were competitive recurve shooters. And my dad was a big bow hunter. So I grew up at a, at a young age, traipsing around in the woods with him and then hunting on my own. And so I've just been bow hunting most of my life, except when I lived in Southeast Asia, did mission work in Thailand. They're like bow hunting. They believe in reincarnation, so they consider it a sin. You might be killing someone's great great grandmother or something like that. <laughs> so gotcha, I, yes. I came back to the States and I've made up for lost time. And so I love bow hunting. And and then I I I won this broadhead in a raffle at one like or not a raffle it's like a a giveaway on yeah. archery talk an online forum, and it was a really expensive broadhead. And the guy said, "Hey, I see you have a little YouTube channel." I had like one hunting video. He goes, "Maybe do a broadhead test of it." I'm like, "Okay." So I just like shot it into a pumpkin. I shot it into a frozen hog shoulder. Like I was like, "What else can I shot it into a dinner plate?" I'm like, "What else can I shoot?" I didn't know how to test broadheads, but it got a lot of views, and I thought, yeah. hey, "This is really cool." So then that's evolved, and my my civil engineering, my bow hunting, and then speaking as a pastor, it all kind of came together with this channel that I kind of started in earnest about 2017. And now my bread and butter is broadhead testing. So I test, I've tested over 300 broadheads, I believe it is, and have all those videos on my channel. Of course, I still do a ton of bow hunting because I love to test them in the field and I love to bow hunt. I'm a bow hunter first and then I test other gear. So my, my thing is my YouTube channel that I've just been building Lusk Archery Adventures. It's my, my side gig in the ministry, my retirement hope and my passion to just keep doing that. Oh, that's awesome, man. And yeah, like I, I, I mean, I saw even Joe Rogan mentioned you the other day, like there's not too many other people doing that sort of serious, uh, uh, broadhead testing and like something I've always enjoyed because I've actually followed you for well probably about as long as I've been bow hunting now for five years too or something and you know I like how you're always cr critical of your own tests as well and trying mm -hmm. to find a hole in it and trying to improve that I think that's really you know like overlooked and and so many people are perfect out there do you know what I mean mm -hmm. but there's even some I think like was it the annihilator heads who went back and retested them 
You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, like I made a yeah. mistake. I felt yeah. really bad about that. I think that's so fantastic, admit my man. Mistake. Yeah. 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 And like, like, and, and I think it's just nice that you, you know, you come across as a genuine person and you're happy to own mistakes and, you know, you're happy to try and do the best test possible. Right. Um, yeah. You know. I mean, I'm a learner, right. I, I'm, I want to learn. I, I just got off the phone with a guy over in Germany who designs broadheads and, He's, he's an engineer. He's a metallurgist. So I was just picking his brain. I mean, I took two pages of notes. I, I, I just, I love to learn and I certainly don't understand it all. And I'm constantly learning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's awesome, man. And uh, I mean, it's just, yeah, I mean, I, I can't think of too many other channels. There's a few other people like, I guess the Ranch Fairy does kind of testing, but his isn't so much about broadheads, more of an overall arrow setup you know what I mean? And stuff like that. And I think you use the Bishop arrows or something. Is that right for your tests? Yeah, I do largely Bishop because I I became friends with a guy. That was the guy whose broadhead I won. (laughs) This broadhead that costs like 120 bucks. one broadhead, And I, that's the one I first tested with. So from that time we become really good friends. Oh, that's awesome. uh, Yeah. So he sends me all his stuff, which is, it is not for the normal budget, this no. suffice to say. You, you know, I, I know a little gym. There's a place in Sweden here that uh, has a lot of Bishop Broadheads, but he bought them a long time ago before they got really expensive. Oh. So, so you know what I'm saying? It's some real good bargains to be had there. And I've looked at them a lot, and they're very well-made heads. They really, really are nice. Um, so yeah, I can see the appeal with them for sure. So yeah, their arrows and their broadheads, it's just, it's very high end and, mm-hmm. and I got this connection and honestly, I, I could get financial endorsements from arrow companies, Yes, but I just, I don't get anything from him, but I do get the free arrows, but he's just become such a good friend. That yeah. I, I don't want to leave him high and dry. So yeah. I, I, and I love his arrows. So I just keep using his arrows. Yeah. That's cool, man. That's really, really good. It's, it's nice to have like kind of loyal connections as well. You know what I mean? Like there's a lot of, you've probably seen it too, like kind of, fl- what do you want to call it? Fly by night is flash in a pan kind of stuff that happens that you see quite regularly happen. You know, if someone will be promoting something for a couple of months and then they move to something else and things like that. And again, like I was saying before, is you can't really trust somebody that bounces between brands too much. I don't think mm. because it's always the next and best. And you know what I mean? And yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm picky so, about that too. Yeah. Hey, so you just went to Argentina, right? Yeah. And that was one of your dream hunts, I think, correct? Was it? Bro, everything's a dream hunt for me, but that that was that was definitely one of them. I mean, I just like I just dream because I get a bit of a revenue from the 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 channel mm-hmm. and sponsorships and that's helped me to be able to live out dreams going to Alaska to hunt grizzly bear, yeah. Africa. I mean, a number of places, Newfoundland for moose. And then, so I really wanted to go after a red stag and Mm -hmm. I was debating, we talked about it a bit. I was debating New Zealand or Argentina. And I thought, you know, Argentina is like only three hours of time change yeah. (laughs) and they have a direct flight from Dallas, Fort Worth and it's overnight flight. You just wake up and you're there. Mm-hmm. So there was some advantage. I thought, well, let me try Argentina this time. Yeah. So I did. And I, I don't regret it. I, I had a wonderful time. Yeah. That's awesome. So you went for red stag and a water buffalo, right? Yeah. I, you know, I originally, I just went for red stag, mm-hmm. but I knew one of the advantages of Argentina, kind of like Africa at, at the same ranch, depending on the ranch, you can hunt free range, Red stag, a number of different sheep, uh, some goats, black buck, uh, like an antelope kind of thing, as well as water buffalo. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And they, they were all introduced in that area of Argentina, like in the mid 1800s, and they flourished to cover much of Argentina now. And so this is just a working cattle ranch. It's not a high fence ranch but it has all these species on it. So I went originally for red stag and, you know, I love that. Got a nice red stag. And then I'm like, Hey man, I, you know, when else am I going to come here? I've already paid for the travel. You yeah. Know, that, that, that buffalo is looking mighty tempting. So yeah, then I added on a water buffalo. Nice, man. That's cool. So tell us about like your bow setup, and did you use the same arrow for the 
water buffalo as you did for the raised egg, or I, did you have different? I did not. That's a really good question. I um, so I had a brand new setup this year. I mm-hmm. you know I do a lot of bow testing on my channel. I have a bunch of bow battles, usually like in fall here in the states. That's when the the the, the new bows come out. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I would, I had a great shop in Iowa that I would go to. They'd open early just for me. They'd set up all the flagship bows for me. And I do a bow battle comparison just for my setup. And I love doing that. Here, I'm not quite set up to do that, but I've, I'm familiar with a lot of the bows and I always really liked Elite. Mm-hmm. And so I decided to go with an Elite uh, elite Era. It's a carbon mm-hmm. bow, has a little bit longer axle to axle. I was using a Bowtech CP28, which I still have and I love. Yeah. But this is like a, about a 31 inch axle to axle. Mm-hmm. It's carbon, so it's super light. It's about a pound lighter than my previous setup. And then it has like a seven and a quarter inch brace height. Wow, that's um, nice. It has a really smooth draw, a little hump at the end. I had mm-hmm. to get used to, but it's a brand new setup. And I got the bow in mid January, and this hunt was like mid March. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it. You think you can get set up really quickly, but man, I had to change the arrows a little bit, went with a little different length of arrow and, and getting it all tuned and all set up took quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And I got dialed in just a few weeks before the trip. And then I'm like shooting as much as I could yeah. to get ready. But but so the, the bow, it's at elite arrow. It's like it's 68 pounds, 27 inch draw. And I'm using uh, for, for the red stack, like my normal setup is like a 500 grain bishop foc king arrow mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and i was using a uh, sever 1.75 mm-hmm, broadheads mm-hmm. love sever broadheads they're yeah. the most durable mechanical there is and yes and so for flight forgiveness there's a big advantage of having a mechanical but then for the uh i thought maybe i'm gonna hunt a buffalo so i threw in seven uh fat eliminators like really heavy like well 750 grains so 750 grain along with the tip yes. compared to 500 grain and i had a bunch of trifecta fixed blade broadheads it's a new fixed blade broadhead that came out last year okay i don't so know I if i've seen those bag yeah that wouldn't be my perfect choice for water buffalo but i thought you know it'll probably do the job with 750 mm-hmm. grains along along with it and so then I had the challenge of like, I didn't want to recite in my bow and redo my pins. So using the pins I had, I had to figure out, well, how does the 750 grain shoot yeah. using the pins of the 500 grain? Yes. And then I figured out, well, it's, it's 50% heavier. So it's, I just, whatever the yardage was, I would just divide it by, or multiply by 1.5 yes. and use that pin. So 30 yards, I'd use the 45 yard mm-hmm. setting. So anyway, you know, it, it's like in the heat of the moment, you got to calculate it and it kind of, you know, it's kind of hard to do, but, yes. but that's what I did with the Buffalo and it worked out well. Yeah. That's cool, man. That's really, really good. So, um, I have stared a few Cape Buffalo face to face now and they mm. are scary animals. What are the... What a buffalo like? Are they kind of similar to? They look like they look at you like you owe them money, or, or you know, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, personally, I don't think they look as nasty because Cape buffalo have that boss, and that mm-hmm. boss just looks like I'm going to kill you and yes. I'm pound you into the the, the the dirt, and they do that, right? Yeah. But and they kill more professional hunters than any species on the planet. But water buffalo get bigger. They get slightly bigger and they're they're I mean, they are beasts and they are also are territorial and charge people. I don't think they're as dangerous as Cape Buffalo, but when you got, you know, two thousand pounds of animal close to you looking mean, I mean we had a few of our hunters charge that week. They weren't hunting buffalo, they were hunting red stag. But they got within like 100 yards of the buffalo and they got charged by the wow. buffalo. They literally went running, two different groups. And, yeah. and so, yeah, there was a bit of trepidation mm-hmm. in, in my heart. That's for mm-hmm. sure. Yeah. It's um like the other thing about Cape Buffalo is and stuff is like their eyes are just black. So it's kind of hard. Like I feel like some animals you can kind of get like a, a little bit of an emotional read from them or something. But 
you know, <laughs> these things just stonewall you all the time and you're like, okay, mm. well, you know, I'm not sure what's going on. So I, I, from <laughs> what I see, the water buffalo is kind of similar with that, that sort of facial looks and stuff. So, Oh, man, it's scary to stare them down. Yeah. 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 So um, now the videos aren't out yet, right? No, they I'm are. You I just them? dropped them. You just yeah, did. I, okay, okay. Sorry, well, radio. Sorry. The red stag was was like last month, like a week ago, and Aha, then the water buffalo was bad. this week. Okay, right. cool, man. Yeah, so yeah, they're both yeah. Out. Yeah, that's cool. So, I mean, hopefully, people are going to go in and watch, watch them now. But like, out of those two, which one was the best for you? Gosh, that's like, you know, they each have their nuance, right? The mm-hmm. cool thing about a red stag is we're hunting during the roar. Yeah, the roar oh yeah. Is what we'll call the rut, you know, yeah. over here in the States, but they're mating season. And man, I'm used to elk. You know, they make that, you know, screeching sound. Yeah. You know, but those red stag are like, Whoa. Yeah. It sounds like a lion mated with a yeah. cow, you know? Yeah. I mean, it is a roar. And yeah. when you're in the woods and you're hearing, Whoa, like, all over you it yeah exhilarating and so we're chasing the roars you know to try yes and they're really wary too and yeah so, you know what was crazy is the first morning we're going out and we've been chasing these two roars we're hearing and we're getting closer getting closer getting closer then we hear a boom rifle shot and i'm like what the heck and we run up there 100 yards ahead see a dead stag one that we'd been pursuing and three poachers hop in the fence to run away and they have to deal with poachers there because in Argentina poaching it's just a misdemeanor and there's no wildlife and fisheries wardens they're just the local police so what can they do Mm -hmm. throughout the country Mm -hmm. so that and then you know so we recovered the stag but I was kind of like man I came all this way for a bow hunting only area, yes. I got to compete with a poacher. Yeah, so I, was, yeah. I started pretty discouraged. But yeah. then, you know, we got into more stags and that was just, that was awesome. I, I just loved it. There, I love hunting elk and I love to hunt the European counterpart. Yeah. And so that had its its cool factor to it. But the water buffalo, I've taken a, a now a, an American buffalo, a bison with my bow and I've taken a Cape buffalo with my bow. I got him here in my room. So this was kind of cool to add a water buffalo. Like I was like, yeah, you know, I'll go for the trifecta of buffalo. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Actually, I don't know if there's a slam for that, but probably. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, a cow slam. <laughs> yeah, the bovine know, but, slam. The, the bovine slam. I like that <laughs> yeah. one. That's good. That's good. So, yeah, no, the um, the like once you've heard a red deer roar, like. An elk sounds like it's been kicked in the nuts really bad. You know <laughs> what I mean? True. Like, yeah, it uh, does the height. Like, for such a big animal, that noise is kind of strange coming from an elk, you know. But That's equally, how I feel about a stag, though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mean, well, but I used like, to it, hear an elk. Yeah, but I would feel like, for, for me, like logically, you think about musical instruments, like something that's big, like you feel like something deep is going to come from it. You know what I mean? And then, like, I this do. elk's like. Yeah, <laughs> but, but yeah. you know what's cool about the elk? I guess they've adapted because they used to be a plains game, but now they're in the mountains. Mm-hmm. But that screech that that carries yeah. for miles, you know, yeah. across the the mountains and stuff. It's, mm-hmm. it's an, I don't know if a roar would carry that far. Maybe it would, but yeah, that so well, high pitched. Yeah, I think I can't remember which way sound travels better. Isn't that low frequencies go further than high? Maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. I'm trying to remember now. But anyway, yeah, I mean, they they seem to echo around pretty good. And Alka electrifying as well. You know what I mean? It's not a competition. Yeah, they're both going as intimidating in different ways as each other. It's just kind of funny to to, to compare them. So, and, And like, I don't know if you know, but like the elk in New Zealand breed with the red stags over there. So they're very. Oh, I wondered if they cross. They're very closely related, yeah. And oh, so, is there yeah. a different name for the crossbreed, or is it? Just called uh, I think they're just calling it a Wapiti cross or a red cross, is what they call it now. They don't have a different subspecies name for it or whatever, but um, it's creating a little bit of problem. And also, the red deer and seeker uh, crossbreed as well. Oh, so not wow. not Sitka, but the seeker deer. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, yeah, with yeah. That. A lot of Americans uh, think it's Sitka, but yeah, they're uh-huh. different. Different deer species. So, Different deer. Um, yeah, so it's kind of interesting, but um, I'm not really sure exactly what it's producing. Some of the racks obviously probably get a little bit 
more unpretty, if you or, you know what I mean. They're not oh, uh-huh. they don't kind of have that nice genetic formity uh, and stuff like that. It's been a little while since I've Googled them, actually, but uh, I do think that they use some of the body size to get some of the bigger genetics into the red stags in New Zealand. Oh. I, th- I think a little bit. They do a little bit of dabbling with that and stuff too, but yeah, so that's kind and of And I know in Argentina the, the racks are not nearly as impressive hmm. as they are but, in New Zealand. But we talked about this, like, and anyone that's listened to this, like the big racks in New Zealand are bred like that, right? They're all high fence stags. You do not find red stags like that in the wild. So hmm. if you've got a mate there with one of those nice big New Zealand red stags on the wall, I have two. They're from fenced areas, okay, and yeah. so it's it's just a different thing. Um, yeah, so it's like a yeah. Texas high high fence ranch, exactly the same thing. But you know, I see, yeah. But it's a unique thing for New Zealand. It you is. Know? It's appealing, yeah. and it's yeah. so beautiful in mm-hmm. all the pictures I see. Yeah, the videos. Yeah. It just looks like a cool place to hunt. Yeah, it's a beautiful country. Like uh, growing up there, I thought the whole of the world was like that. You know, like we just about <laughs> have every biome there in New Zealand. We have deserts, rainforests, glaciers you know, volcanic area, thermal area, uh, you know, and really dry areas, flats, hills, Alps, just everything, islands, you name it, it's all there basically. So wow. when I came to Europe and Sweden, I was like, I'm going to jump on the train and go for a look across Sweden. That was like the boringest thing I've ever done. It was <laughs> just <laughs> the same thing for five or six hours, you know, just flat, red house, yellow house, lake, birch tree pine tree and then just repeat that order basically so mm. yeah that was yeah you kind were of spoiled interesting. for sure yeah definitely it's just so funny growing up in a little closed off box you know what i mean like mm. you don't really know until you open it up so mm. yeah so john let's get into some like kind of more i want to pick your brains on some broadhead stuff right okay. so um i personally like i have used expandables in the past and i i think my my personal view we started is that like Every broadhead is a tool, right? And I think that expandables have their place. They just, you know, there's obviously trade-offs between them and, and a fixed blade heads, right? Yeah. Uh, and like, I guess that's probably why you didn't use the expandable on the cape on the water buffalo, for instance, right? I was, kind of to, I was tempted to put a follow-up shot with yes. just to see what would happen, but yeah. yeah, that's why I didn't for sure. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, is there like like in your Mine, why do you pick an expandable most of the time? If I'm getting your, like, I follow you like well enough to know that Sev is basically your go to. Is that correct for, for most of well, your hunting? You know, I've taken, I don't know, probably 200 animals or so with my mm-hmm. bow. I, I well lost count. And I'd say in the last couple of years, probably half of them have been with the Sever. Mm-hmm. But then I use a lot of different heads. And mm-hmm. so I, I just enjoy. If something tests really well for me, then I put it in the quiver. And like the way I say, it earned a spot in my quiver. And then so when I go out hunting, I'll often, probably most of the time, I'll have two different, at least two different broadheads in my quiver. Mm -hmm. And I'll know in advance that they both fly very well. But, you know, like, like say I went to Newfoundland and I was moose hunting. I had an iron wheel. In case, because we were doing some calling, if I had a mm-hmm. moose coming in, I had a frontal shot. Yeah, I got gotcha. I want a small, tough, mm-hmm. sharp, fixed blade head. But then if it was a really windy condition or a really long shot or a rush shot or probably not a rush shot, or like a follow-up shot I at range, yep. I had sever 1.5s. Mm-hmm. And so we were calling a moose. This moose came in and he was coming right at us, but he turned broadside. Well, I had the iron wheel. I paced him with the iron wheel, which is fine. It ran off to 70 yards and my follow-up arrow was a Sever 1.5 because they're so stinking accurate. And I just drilled it mm-hmm. with a Sever 1.5, 1.5. And th- but that's what I'll do. You know, I have different heads for different situations. So mm-hmm. like you said it really well, everything's a trade-off. Yes. With a mechanical, you're getting incredible flight. Yes. And my bow's well tuned. I can shoot fixed blade heads very well. But yeah. when there's wind, when I'm rushed, when my hands are shaking a little bit, which they do, that forgiveness, or it's windy, man, mm-hmm. that forgiveness of a mechanical, that's a big commodity. Then it mm-hmm. also has a much wider cut. And so I, I like the wider cut, provided it's not too big of an animal. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I want to get enough penetration, but then a fixed blade, if my goal is maximum penetration, 
then I'm putting a fixed blade in. Mm. So like I was hunting a hog this last, uh, this last year and I usually have severs and then I have some fixed blade in case it's a really big hog or it's facing away from me and yep. I got to shoot it. Like they call it a Texas heart shot. Yeah. 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 I got to yeah. shoot it from the back. Well, I walked up while it was almost still dark and I walked up on this massive boar in a field facing away from me at 20 yards. I'm like, is that a hog? I'm like, oh my gosh, that's a hog. And I reach in my quiver. All I had were severs. And I'm like, I hope this works. Yeah. And I Texas hard shot, man, it went 20 yards and was dead. No, so, I mean, it can work even without yeah. that. I knew in that situation, I'd have been better off with a smaller fixed blade to maximize penetration. Mm. So I yeah. use a lot of different heads and, yeah. but I, I do base them on the animal mm -hmm. and on the shot distance yeah. and then my setup. Yeah. If I'm going really long shots, really windy shots on a smaller animal, then I'm going with a, a, a sever. Sever is the most durable mechanical. There's other mechanicals I like as well, but it's just in my testing, the sever is the most durable, you know, fixed blade, you, you know, you're going to get durability. But mechanicals, some of them really but, fall apart. But like, like it's funny you say that because I don't think that's necessarily true. Like, there's a lot of crap fixed blades out there that are not durable, and you know that more than anybody, right? So, like, yeah. I find that a weird blanket statement for you to make. I'm just going to be honest. Yeah, with you. I like, shouldn't have said yeah. that. Yeah, I yeah. Say, <laughs> but by yeah. and large, you know, yeah, yeah, by and large, yeah. True. There are some fixed blade heads that are less durable than many mechanicals. Oh yeah, and exactly. I go, well, what's the advantage of that? Like, yeah. Yeah. If yeah. I'm using a fixed plate, I want great durability. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You're and, right. You're right. Yeah. And I, I like, I'm not ragging on you too. It's just kind of more of the conversation we're talking about it. So, but yeah, I, like, I think, I think that's what people would need to kind of stop uh, thinking about is what is the best broadhead? I think mm -hmm. it's, what am I doing? What do I want to achieve? And like, for me, I love getting maximum penetration. Like I can't think of an animal I've shot in the last few years where I haven't had complete pass through. Okay. But here's the trade off. And I was talking to, cause I'm sponsored by Vantage Point Archery, right? So I use basically only fixed plates now, but a lot of the single bevel stuff. And, uh, at the moment, those new Omega heads, I think you've tested yeah. those, right? Yeah. Tested, yeah. I love those. Man, those things do go through, I think a little bit better than the, the other single bevels they had. They seem to just, there's not even really a noise anymore. You know, it just goes through and, and that's mm. the dirt. But, um, I was talking to VPA about it and I I'm kind of like on the other side now where I feel like I almost have wasted efficiency is what, what how I feel about it. And like, I want a little bit more cut, uh, cutting area on the deer and stuff that I'm, I'm shooting because it can't be kind of coincidence now that I'm like, I'm really trying to remember the last time I had an arrow hanging out of it, an animal and I can't actually remember one. I'd have to go back and look at my videos, but it's just like, okay, well, they're obviously working really good because the animals are dying, you know, but like efficiency wise, do you know, do you, know, do you kind of know where I'm going oh, with this? I know yeah. exactly what you mean. I, you know, I used to use slick trick standards. This is yes. many years ago. Took a yes. lot of animals with them, but I would shoot, or I used even before that a wasp boss bullet. It's like a really small three blade, like one inch cutting diameter, three blade, little mini mm. blades. And I would just zip them right through an air, uh, an animal. They'd bury in the ground about eight inches and I'd walk away kind of going, well, I wasted a bunch of my momentum yep. on dirt. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, and, 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 and blood trails would be kind of sparse at times. Yep. So then I just thought, why don't I use the biggest head I can use and still have a very good chance at a pass through. Mm -hmm. I'd rather have two holes. Mm -hmm. So that's what I try to base my broadhead choice on. Like what's going to give me a very good chance. Can't always guarantee it. Very good chance at two holes, but the biggest cut possible while making those two holes. Just because, yes. you know, it's all about, did you clip that artery? Yeah. Did you clip that lung? Like, man, that's everything. I've, mm. I've double lung stuff where there's no blood because it's yes. a high lung shot or yep. you just didn't hit an artery. Yeah. I've like had what I didn't think was a good shot and blood is just spewing out everywhere. Yep. But, but the bigger the broad head, the better chance you're going to clip that artery. So I switched and that's when I started shooting. Uh, first I went to slick tricks and I'm like, I want a little bit wider. I went to mm -hmm. Exodus, mm -hmm. use them effectively. I, I really like Exodus, but yes. but yeah, I, I had the same thought that I don't want to waste 
my kinetic energy. Then I, you know, I went to single bevels for a while and I still use those. I, I love those two blades. Yes. But I would zip them through like hogs. Mm. And if I hit it a little bit too far back, man, I got nothing. I got mm-hmm. no blood. It would zip right through. I'd get the arrow. But then I'm like, man, it was hard to find. It was hard to get the, the recovery. And there was times I miss animals. And, and so then I thought, yeah, you know, but if I had shoulder, I'd rather have that small two blade. Yeah, that's the and thing. And it's kind though, of like yeah. pick your poison. And so, yeah. you know, I try to find a, a middle ground. That's what I personally what I like about the sever. It has a big wide cut. Unless it, one of the blades hits a heavy bone, then mm-hmm. it, it, it kind of it swiv- swivels. And, and mm-hmm. then it can pass by that, yeah. that bone and keep cutting. But, but, you know, it's kind of a balance between the two. But, you know, then I've had big, giant broadheads. And then I shoot an animal right in the shoulder. I'm like, oh, I should have used my little big two bite. It's it's all a pick your poison. What what's your you know? So I try to figure out yeah. what's my and, animal, what's and, my shot set up. And and that's the whole thing too, is like you were talking about before, and a lot of people think this is like blasphemy to talk about, but you know, I take front shot, frontal shots. I've done a lot and I've never had any problems with them. I've never shot an animal yet in the front that hasn't died. Mm-hmm. I put it that way, okay? And 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 so then I go back to like, well, should I really change my setup? Because I have available options, you know, almost anywhere around. Anyway, the animal's positioned, you know what I mean? I'm not too scared. Obviously, I'd, I'd, I always try and take the best shots I can. But, you know, we're hunting. You have to take a chance, you know, sometimes uh, that, that isn't ideal, you know. So, you know, that's why I go back to is like maybe I just shouldn't touch anything. You know, my arrow's working good. Animals are falling over dead. But, you know. 90% of the time, I feel like I've got wasted efficiency there. So it's, no, uh, I, I yeah. hear you. Yeah. I, I know that thing. But yeah, mm. I have friends in Argentina as a guy who's hunting with it. His goal is you know, he has an 80 pound bow, 29 and a half inch draw length. I think it's it's either seven or 800 pound setup. And he uses a really long one inch, two blade, single bevel broadhead. But his, he's a big elk hunter. He just aims right for the shoulder, no matter what the angle. Just like mm-hmm. you said, if mm-hmm. it comes in quartering and with elk, you know, you're calling, it comes in quartering, it's a frontal, sh- no matter what, he knows he's probably going to go right through that shoulder. That's what he aims for. Mm-hmm. Whereas I tend to use a different setup and I'm like, I got I don't want to hit the shoulder. I want to hit right behind the shoulder. And, yeah. You know, everybody has their own style. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, like I shot a stag front on in Latvia, actually, and I think it was about 25 yards or something. And I got lucky that it actually spun in favor of my arrow a little bit. So I got it in a really good spot uh, in that lung and stuff like that, too. But um, that might be the last one I can think of where the arrow was hanging out of the animal uh, yeah shit, i have to go back but it died still but you know what i mean like that was only a 420 grain arrow with a three oh, blade. Wow. yeah yeah like that one i look back at that shot now because i got it on film and i kind of cringe a little bit like you know like at the time you feel so confident but even myself as kind of a passenger on that film i'm like why did you take that shot i mean it, it all ended up well good and well but there must be a lot of people that watch that like what an idiot why would you risk that shot you know what i mean <laughs> so, your quarterback yeah yeah exactly and you know like i'm quite openly critical about myself and things like that and especially because bow hunting is such a sensitive topic in europe that you know you really have to protect yourself and the sport all the time it's not you know like for instance it's illegal in sweden and, and about 50 percent of the countries in europe you cannot bow hunt and actually it's rough the rough stats so um yeah you you kind of really have to be sure uh, you know 300 percent, not just for yourself but because of everybody else too so that's a good point that's good to be responsible like that yeah yeah and you know like it's hunting man i've had stuff that 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 hasn't gone well you know but like it's stuff that can happen with a rifle too people don't think about that stuff you know it's they just do a bow hunting. It's like, well, but that could have happened with a rifle too. You know what I mean? Like it's exactly. It's, yeah. So, but, uh, no, that's, that's all good. So, uh, we'll touch on it. I wasn't going to, but I think that's good too. It's like blood trails. Like I had a really good sort of debate with Troy, uh, um, about it. And I honestly think that you cannot have predictable blood trails ever. That's my, my, uh, take on it. It doesn't matter what broadhead you have. Sure. 
if you could somehow simulate exactly the same hit on an animal with 10 broad different broadheads, you might get slightly different blood trails. For, you know what I mean? Like exactly yeah. what you're talking about. Maybe one is one inch away from an artery where, you know, you've got two inch cut on a mechanical and that might hit that. So I'm not debating that. But exactly like you said before, I, most high lung shots that I've done and I've seen, you don't get much of a blood trail. Like the, the chest cavity fills up, especially on bigger things like the red deer and stuff, for instance. Like if I watch a client's arrow go in a bit high, I think, okay, this, the placement was good, but we're probably not going to get a lot of blood on the ground from this. And it's just because it's gravity, man. It's a, you know, it's a huge big bucket, the chest is, and that's where all the, it's coming from. And then the other thing that I am more sure about is if you get like a perfect shot, which is not a, like to me is not a heart shot. It's just above the top of the heart. Okay. So if you sever all the valves and all the, you know, the, the vessels and stuff there, you get instant blood loss. Okay. If you hit the, the heart, it can kind of function a little bit still. And so you get a little bit of pressure there, but if you sever those arteries and main, uh, my brain today, but you know, what I'm talking about the main plumbing, then, then you lose that, that pressure instantly. Okay. And that, reduces your blood uh, trail by, you know, 99%, I'm sure, because as an animal's running, most of that blood, I would say, is getting forced out the holes with some sort of pressure uh, as it's running, right? Because everyone knows that, like, once something's dead, things don't bleed anymore. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And you are kind of already have a dead animal running in that situation. And I am sure there's so many people like you you probably read social media too i know the shot was good i can't see any blood anymore i'm really worried and i'm sure that happens so much and people think because there's no blood on the ground that it was a bad shot but some mm. of the best shots i've made there has been no blood trail but usually i can see the animal fall over so that's the mm. only difference about it all so i just kind of wanted to see if you i mean you don't you know, you don't really test blood trails in your channel. It's hard to do. You almost can't. But, like, what is your kind of take on all that? Like, do you have your own opinions on it? Man, what do you, you think about it? You, you're speaking my language when you talk about this. And I really yeah. appreciate what you said about the predictability or lack thereof. Yes. I have this video that I put out a couple of years ago called Broadheads and Blood Trails, Understanding the Connection. One of the things that drives me crazy, I get it all the time, is people will ask about a broadhead, and their first question is, does it give good blood trails? Yeah, that's <laughs> it's like, yeah. <laughs> it's yes. going to do what that you know broadhead does if it mm -hmm. goes through where you hit it. Like, yes. you're putting an inch of steel, it'll make what up. It all, it, but people just don't get it because no. they go by what their friend Marketing. anecdotal evidence like yes. their friend goes oh man you know i shot it and there was blood everywhere so they think that broadhead does that or yes. they shoot one they go there's no blood this broadhead sucks and, yep. it, and, and i don't want to say it has nothing to do with it because broadheads do have something to do with it of course but yeah man it's where you hit i mm -hmm. i've seen like in x-rays maybe you've seen these but and i use this in my in my video but where there'll be like a construction worker on the news that falls and his nail gun goes off and he's got a nail yeah. right through his brain and he's yeah. like fine he's like yeah. you know, hey man i got a nail you're like dude yeah. what happened and they do the x-ray it just happened to hit this spot yes. where there's nothing there and you're yeah. like how that's what can happen with mm -hmm. the broadhead and there are principles like you said my okay my red stag i thought it was a perfect shot it was a high lung shot there was, I mean, the hole was like that. Yes. And there was so little blood. Yes. I was like, what the heck? It was, it was exactly what you said. And then you said it too. The water buffalo, I drilled it straight through the heart. We, when we did the autopsy, I mean, yes. I got a heart and their heart is not small. Yeah. And there is a, the broadhead is sticking straight through it. It's through about that far. But, and it, it performed a little, you know, the, the, it was like wobbling. It knew something's wrong, but it didn't know what was wrong. And it mm -hmm. took a while to expire mm -hmm. and there wasn't a lot of blood. Yeah. But then I've shot others where you clip that artery and it is just spraying buckets. Yeah. But man, there's so many variables. Of course, the, the, the sharpness, the size of your broadhead, that yes. makes a difference. Yeah. But whether you hit that artery, whether it's high lung or low lung, 
how it moves after the shot does the shoulder cover up the hole sometimes yes. you know you shoot it mm-hmm. and then your shoulder comes over well now that that blood can't get out that hole mm-hmm. anymore or fat plugs it up or tissue yeah. plugs it up yeah there are so many variables that i absolutely agree with you it mm-hmm. is you can make some some assumptions mm-hmm. but it's not the same you know every no. time no and and like like i i um you know, messed the shot up on this white tower like seven yards. That might be two or three years ago now. And I actually originally thought it was a good shot, right? And uh, it ran off and looked around about 40 yards, and I thought, oh, I'll just put another one in it, just speed it up. You know what I mean? And I ended up doing a terrible shot. Like as I shot, it spun around, and I hit it completely in the hip joint, but I completely mm-hmm. shattered its pelvis. Like when I took oh. when I put it, the hip bone was cracked, and the ball joint in the, the like the actual ball was in half in the back oh, of the wow. Okay? So um, that was with a Grim Reaper. <laughs> wow. Yeah, wow, That's right? Impressive. Yeah, one of those uh, razor tip uh, whitetail things, I think it was. I can't remember. Whitetail but... special? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, that's surprising. I don't know if I have one. I can find I can find out what I had. I do keep a lot of my old broadheads. I don't know where they are now. But um, anyway, and but I was like, okay, it ran off, but I thought, oh, the first shot's good anyway, so that won't be too far away because it was obviously not moving very fast with an arrow lodged in its hip. Um, and uh, I, then I looked at the ground. I was like, man, that's a lot of white hair on the ground. And I went back and looked at the video footage. I was like, oh, no. And it was quartering uh, away from me a little bit, and basically I clipped the, the front of its shoulder, and it just opened the whole chest up on the front of it, right? So it just – like really open the whole thing, oh, up. but uh-huh. it, but it didn't get any lungs or anything on that on that. But the blood trail from that deer was insane. Like you know, you could have been blind and and followed that thing, and we did. And but it was we had to sh- uh, shoot it with a rifle, and we found it was still a little bit uh, conscious, unfortunately. Um, but that was like the best blood trail I've ever had, and you know, it was two terrible shots. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's just really interesting that. You know, like if you'd shown anyone that, they would be like, oh, that's a dead deer. And, you know, if I'd left it overnight, it would have been. But we don't do that in Europe. Like we just, it's not a thing. We'll get it, like we'll leave it, give it a, get a tracking dog on it and stuff like that. And uh, Oh, I see. Try and follow it up um, mm. where, where possible, basically. So, mm. um, yeah, but that's, it's just kind of interesting. And, and, yeah, everything I've seen and done now, I'm just like, man, that blood trailing thing is just a marketing it's just all marketing talk, you know, and like you'll know too that, you know, I've worked with enough people in the industry now to know that most of the hunting videos you see are 80% bullshit. Like, <laughs> you know, a lot of it's filmed after the hunting, oh, you yeah. know what I mean? Or it's the stuff you're seeing is not even what was happening at the time and things like that, different part. And so a lot of those broadhead videos I look at, I'm sure they put like squirt blood out. Mm. You know what I mean? Like there's like some famous rage ones i won't say who they are and stuff but like maybe people know which i'm talking about right it's a famous guy he's he's it seems like a stand-up guy anyway but he, he does a an ad for rage and the blood trail from a white-tailed deer on there is i mean i don't i, I don't there wouldn't be many people who have seen a, a trail like that you know what i mean mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. it's a little unbelievable mm-hmm. maybe it's real i don't know i'm not gonna put stamp my name on it and say it's fake or whatever but people just need to realize my point is is that Blood trails is a marketing term. It's what, you know, broadhead companies use to try and sell their broadheads. It's not a realistic thing that you can, um, you know, uh, base a head off. That's what I'm trying to say. Is, That's is that right. it's, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All you can do is stack the odds in your favor. You mm-hmm. know, the best shot you can make, thinking about where is the arrow going to exit. Yes. The, the, the best broadhead you can use, the sharpest broadhead, the most durable. I mean, I always think of it like, okay, I want accuracy. I want blades that are sharp initially, but then mm-hmm. hold their edge. So it's cutting effectively all the way through. I want durability so it keeps its cut size yes. throughout the whole tissue of the animal. It doesn't like lose a blade right away because then less chance you're going to get a blood trail. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the, the, the accuracy, the, the sharpness, the edge retention, the, the durability and something that penetrates well, mm. like those are the factors that I think stack the odds in my favor. But even that stuff happens 
And man, when you add in a live animal, oh, different yeah. angles, movements, different anatomies, mm. biology, like you cannot, it's, it's, it's not programmable. No, no, it's not. And like, uh, it's kind of like, why, like, uh, I mean, this is not really do what we're talking about, but it reminded me, it's like, I used to shoot a single pin because I like the accuracy that it gave me, you know, but really in hunting, the hunting I do, it's just not practical. You know what I mean? Like That's the animals, I feel too. The, I mean, I the animals the are moving all the time. And like, I went to the easy V and I have not, I don't want to change both sides. I went to an electric one last year just to try it. Like a company asked me, Hey, can you try this out? And I said, yeah, sure. And I gave it back and I said, look, fantastic site. Does exactly what you told me it is. It, it works, but it doesn't work for my style of hunting. You know what I mean? And I've gone back yeah. to the easy V, which is, you know, the, about the most caveman kind of. Uh, I've seen it in your videos. Yeah, dude. Yeah, do you like that? Oh, dude, it's so freaking good. Like, I don't even think. I, I just shoot and it goes exactly where I'm looking. It's the only way to only way to describe it, right? You do like, like obviously, like I try and do a little bit, a few range checks, especially if I'm in a saddle or something just to pull some markers out so I have a good idea. But then I just set that V on the lungs, just double check it, and then look exactly where on the arrow to go and pull through. And it's magic every time, I tell you. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah, it's really good. And so tough too. You know what I mean? Like mm. you're not never going to – there's no pins to bend on it if you're going through bush and, and stuff like that. Or, mm. um, you know, I accidentally dropped my bow in Georgia and nothing was wrong with the sight. Nothing was wrong with the bow either, thank Christ. But, you know, it was uh, – it was – yeah – yeah, that's such a good site, and I, it's like uh, it's either you love it or you hate it. So I, there's no no doubt about it. But if you haven't tried it, the magic from it's quite uh, quite interesting, you know. So that's really that's a cool testimony. I appreciate yeah. you sharing that. Yeah, and, and and I mean, like for instance, your um your setup for Argentina, you could have just changed the insert out on it. They just pops oh, out. Oh, I just see. A with a different size animal like that. Uh -huh. Well, no, it's not, it's not to do with the animal. It works off 13 oh. inches, right? But it works off oh. your feet per second of your arrow. So, oh. so like, you could have shot your red deer, you know, have it set up for that, and then just gone back to camp or whatever. It's like it's like a tiny little disc carried it in your backpack, popped it out, oh. popped the new one oh, in. Oh, I didn't then, realize they did that. Yeah, That's so it's based off your arrow speed. So all the Vs change depending on how fast oh. your arrow is going. Oh, yeah, and okay. that's how they set that up. So... Um, yeah, I mean, I don't run two different arrow sizes, but if I was going to, that's what I'd be doing basically is, is, uh, yeah, then there's no, there's not that guesswork that you're doing. It's, it's yeah. set up perfectly for it. So, and like, I don't like, I used to have target panic. I don't anymore and I haven't for a while, but it was because I never knew to look at the pin or the animal. That mm. was my main problem. You know, I'd go in and out of focus between the two and obviously that, kind of messes you up and if someone's mm. listening to this and they're like hey i had that problem too look at the animal don't worry about the pin your brain does the magic for you focus on the animal okay that's the key to getting over that one but now there's no pins so you just have this clear line of sight to your animal you don't have to worry about anything else and if you do any nighttime shooting it's great too like especially if there's a little bit of moon you can kind of silhouette the animal with the v oh. and then turn the light on so you've got minimum amount of time that the animal the animals lamps like for boars in spain or i don't know you must be able to shoot hogs in texas and night and stuff yeah can you? yeah yeah sure. so it's a great night sight as well there's no pins to focus on again you're just looking straight through it at whatever the torch is on so yeah. nice oh well, that's anyway, appealing that's, yeah yeah and i i recommend playing playing around with it at least um yeah. it's definitely a site that yeah you either stick with it or it doesn't work for you so yeah. Well, I love seeing it in your videos and it's very noticeable. I'm like, oh, he shoots one of those. Like, yeah, I don't know many things. people that do. And so yeah. it's, it's neat to see it. Yeah. And I mean, like, I shot, uh, you know, I've shot quite a few things out to, well, I shot a red stag at 55 meters. What's that? It's about 60 yards, I think. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's yeah. good. And I can, I mean, like, at 20, I can hit the 10 ring all day. At 30, I can mm -hmm. hit it most of the time you know but you're still hitting eights and that's what they're saying is hitting eight hitting eight and fill your freezer you don't have to hit the 10 all the time you know what yeah. i mean like mm -hmm. it's basically what that what they say so yeah it's it's a good site good site i love it so that's good to hear yeah anyway um kind of a few more questions like i never want to put people in a, a place where they feel uh uncomfortable so if you don't want to answer these questions it, it's totally fine it's nothing tricky it's more like what is the worst head you've ever tested john 
Like, you know, oh. are you comfortable to ask the questions like that or you don't want to shit on anyone? That's fine too, you know. I, you know, I'll say this. I, I do try to be really respectful of yes, all I've... of the broadheads because – like in my early years of testing, mm. I would just bash. This is this is crap. I mean, these paper thin blades. These are yes. five cent blades from China. Yes. And then and then I thought, man, this is somebody's dream, somebody's hope. You know, this is yes. their their lifelong project. They're so proud of. And so I really that's when I came up with an objective testing criteria that's quantifiable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to add my own personal commentary as much. I can say, here's how it scored. And yes. then you check out the tests and you you see the scores and you make the decision, is this a good fit for you? Yes. So I try to do that. So I, I don't like to say negative things, but I will say I love testing heads that I go, that is so freaking weird. I think it's going to really flop. And those get the most views. Like, yeah, I love testing them because people go, what the heck? And so I'll just say like a couple that I've tested by, like that are one was called the Mohican sneak. And it's this, this long two blades where they kind of scissor like it, like it, the sling blade or whatever it was. Is that kind of like that one? It's a, it's even different from that, but it's wow. like, I mean, it's it's a it's a weird looking head. Yeah. Okay. And um and then another was I think it's by the same company. Yeah, same company. I just tested. Had this ring. It has three blades and then a ring. Yeah, like a, I made a ring, a blade that's yeah. a ring wrapping around the three blades. And now I'll tell you, when I shot it like into a target or into rubber foam mat, it cores a hole like like mm -hmm. I can imagine in an animal. That, mm -hmm. I mean, it is, it's not like a ring. It's like a freaking hole. It's like mm -hmm. a 12 gauge slug mm -hmm. went straight through it, but the ring breaks off almost immediately. Like in uh -huh. target in in any, in MDF, I mean, it just, yes. it, it's so weak. And, but the weirder it is, the more I like to test it. Sometimes I get surprised. Yeah. I go, wow. Sometimes, usually I don't, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's entertaining and the yeah. audience loves it. So yeah. I love testing the weird stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. It's like, I think too, like, you know, if you had a, I mean, you've got an engineer, a little engineering background, so you, you're different again, but even as a kid, right, you test things like you make your spears and you make, do you know what I mean? It's like somewhere yeah. in most people, there is that kind of engineering understanding on a lower level and most people can look at things and go, that's not a good idea. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. and, 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 it's true. Yeah. And, and it's kind of like, I really admire you for taking that kind of more, you know, you, you, you make up your own mind about the broadhead because I'm on the other side where I think like, I don't do what you did, but I've always thought that like, I kind of think we owe it to the animals to give more of a, a proper fear of you opinion wise on stuff. Do you know what I mean? Because I do. Yeah. I do. But I totally understand where you're coming from on that. And I'm not bagging you on it at all. It's just how I kind of would feel about it is that like, it may be their dream. Right. But like, I don't think that gives them a right to make a broadhead that might be maiming animals rather than, no, I'm with you know, you. And, yeah, and I, I just let the score speak for itself. So, yep. you know, if it gets a low score, Yes. It breaks so easily. People know. Yes. Like, and I don't even mm -hmm. have to say anything. Yeah, but, that's good. But like, yeah, yeah. So that, I mean, that's kind of my theory on it. But I, but I will say this, even with the, say the head I mentioned. Yes. I would not want to get shot with it. Oh, no. Like, I could take, I could take the, <laughs> the weirdest, funkiest, crappiest head. Yes. And they go, that's such a piece of crap. You know, shoot away at me. I go, yeah. Because <laughs> it would hurt. And yeah. It'd probably kill me. And yeah, so exactly. I just go, I, and people, you know, some people go, man, look, it killed this animal. It killed this. I don't doubt they can be lethal. Yeah. But do they stack the odds in your favor? That's yeah. what it, my channel is mm -hmm. all about. I'm going to give you data points. So you can make a choice for the animal you're pursuing, your hunting setup, to stack the odds as much in your favor as possible. Mm. That's all mm. I can do. Yeah. Like I I tested those uh, plastic cheap shot 
Oh, what yeah. they called the buzz cut or something? I can't yeah, remember. Yeah, there's, there's a few of them. They have a cheat buzz... shot. They have buzz cut. They have and because buzz I was, I was genuinely interested in them, right? Because I, I like when you go to New Zealand and you shoot goats or whatever, or people maybe do it in Hawaii and stuff. You don't want to be using expensive broadheads. Mm-hmm. You want to be using the cheap one and dones because you know, like often you'll shoot four or five goats in one outing. So can you imagine oh, how wow. expensive that starts getting? Okay, and so like often this is before VPA times. I'd buy those. Uh, cheap Chinese packets of, of broadheads get twenty for ten dollars or whatever it is, right? <laughs> they shoot great straight wires, and they, you know, they kill the goat no problems, but you just can't reuse the head again. That's mm-hmm. that's fine, right? Put them in the recycling bin, good as gold. But those plastic heads like wouldn't even stand up in my paper box target that I had. Like I just made like a paper box and stuffed it with cloth and stuff, and. They were breaking on that, and I was like, okay, uh, I'm not even going to bother putting these into a goat or something. I said, like, I can't consciously go out with these now knowing how bad they are and I shoot an animal with it. You know what I mean? And, yeah. And and so that was, I mean, I haven't done a lot. I haven't really done a lot of broadly testing. I basically go off kind of what I was talking about before is that looks like a good idea or this is what I'm trying to achieve, and those mm-hmm. broadheads are going to give that for me. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so it's. That's one thing. I know we talked about New Zealand. We're, we're going to go in September, me and a mate, um, for two or three weeks, actually. And, I mean, if I – usually I shoot somewhere between 15 and 20 animals. And wow. Dude, it's a great time for – like, if, if you love bow hunting and want a lot of shot opportunity, it's a place to go, dude. It's amazing. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good time. And, we yeah, we're going to go for – about two or three weeks, um, we've got a couple of different hunting places we're going to go. We're just going to hire a car and go for a, a bow hunting tour, basically. So it's just You're just going to hunt, like, public areas? We'll do some public private. areas. We also have um, – there's a couple of, like, stations, like pub, uh, private stations. They don't have any fences. They oh. just don't want rifle hunters there, so they, they get bow hunters oh. in there. And um, one of them is really good. It's got uh, Arapara ram, pigs, goats, lots of fallow deer. Um, what am I missing? I think there's another species and stuff there, but it's all completely wild. Like it's really wow, awesome. Yeah, that's it's all stalking. Nice. Yeah, you can set your saddle up or whatever you want to. But and I tell you what, price wise, John, it's like I'm trying to remember two hundred and fifty dollars per person for the week what? to go there. Yeah, like a fallow deer will cost you hundred. This is New Zealand dollars, so you can half that. It's like oh hundred. It's like hundred and fifty New Zealand dollars for a fallow deer. It doesn't matter if it's a male or female trophy, whatever, right? Same with the, the wow. sheep or 300 and stuff like that. So like, we're going to have a good time there, you know. And, wow. and I have some, because I grew up in the countryside, I have some uh, contacts where I, I grew up and we're going to go there as well. And, you know, I mean, you would run out of arrows in some of these places. <laughs> yeah, That's like a dream. Dude, it's, it's good fun. You know, it's not trophy hunting. It's just bow hunting. It's really yeah. good fun. Yeah, really, really good. Nice. Fun. Stay in a nice little cottage. Got a fireplace. You have to bring your own food and stuff in, but that's not a problem. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah. 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 It's a good time. You can walk Ooh, out from the fun. cottage. Yeah. So that's cool. All right. Um, well, I don't know how much we never really talked about a time limit on this, Johnny. You got somewhere to be or uh, have you? What time is it? Yeah, I don't know. We've been you going know, about an hour. I got, another, I got another 10 minutes or so. If, yeah, if that's you, cool, but man. If, if you have more questions, if not. Yeah, cool no, thing. that's cool. I, I think we're just kind of, uh, you know, let's have a look. Uh, we've, I'm just going through my notes here because some of this we've already talked about just by by coincidence, really. Mm. Um, so have you had anything to do with the ranch ferry with Troy? Have you guys reached you to know, each we, other? Early on, when I was first getting to know Bishop Archery yes. and my friend at Bishop, Troy was also testing some of, of Sean's stuff, some of Bishop's yes. stuff. And so then Troy and I communicated a bit at that time. I've heard him, people tell me that he says disparaging things about me. And so I, I'm not into that. Like, no. I, you know, I respect him and yes. the way he sees things and love what he does. And mm. um, But I, I, I'm i not into the political game. I get enough of that in church. I oh, just, yeah, I, I don't like people, politics stuff. So, yeah, yeah, I that's just, good. you know, I, I appreciate his audience and, mm-hmm. and all that he does. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think he's – um like I've talked to him quite a bit and, and had a couple of podcasts with him and I get on with him all right. But I think sometimes he's a little – I hope you're listening to this, Troy, but I think he's like a little bit blinded by his own opinion and, and ego. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't think sometimes he's so open to 
like actually looking at what he's talking about. And like, like the podcast we did together, you know, I actually kind of, the first one I ever did, I didn't really know enough. And I was kind of asking him questions. And then two years later, I've got a bunch more experience and, you know, a lot of practical experience. And, you know, I put stuff back onto him a bit more about it. And, you know, so I don't know that he just didn't have answers at the time or has been political, but some of it, you know, kind of, he didn't really have much to say or disagree with with mm. what I was saying when I, I thought it was quite a nice moment actually where I could finally have a proper conversation and talk oh, that's to him about it on his on on the right on the same level kind of um as 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 I'm so yeah that was that was that was that's that's good. But like I think you both do good work but it's different ends of the arrow really. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like yeah. I mean I mean he does a whole arrow approach but his is more about that whole arrow build rather than what's on front of it so much uh, obviously that's a massive component too but um yeah it's just yeah and i what i what i try to do is as an engineer i i want things to be as consistent as i can make them hmm. now some some things are just beyond your control but i try to shoot mediums like for penetration or durability that are as consistent as possible mm-hmm. i wish i could test everything through animals mm-hmm. but even then animals aren't consistent. And so it can look like you hit the same spot. One broadhead breaks, one doesn't. But but does, does it really show anything about the broadhead or no. about the animal? So, But I understand there's limitations with my approach. My approach is it's got to be consistent. But I understand, like say with penetration, my penetration tests, one of them is through layered cardboard. Mm-hmm. Another one is through a combination of rubber foam mat, half inch of MDF and clear ballistics gel. Mm -hmm. I understand that is very different than viscous tissue. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you got tissue where there's liquid, there's blood Mm -hmm. and tissue when it's cut live tissue, it pulls away. Yes. And the, the lubricant, you know, there's not the friction. And I understand that's very different. Whereas you shoot into cardboard, there's no, there's no lubricant. There's, no. You know, there's friction on the surface of the arrow. So I understand that's, it's a very different game, but there's no, there's no medium that people no. can use. But, but the other thing, it. but the other thing I think people get like really need to get back to the basics is the stuff that you're shooting into, right? You know, people you don't shoot drums, right? But if it can hold up to a drum, it's going to hold up to an animal. Good. If it's going through 50 layers of cardboard, it's going to go through an animal. No worries. Do you know what I mean? Like people need to yeah. kind of, people need yeah. to get off their, oh, this isn't the realistic test because of course it's not a realistic test, not an animal. But what you're trying to show is that on something consistently, it performs on this. And, you know, like I'm saying, is if it's going to go through 50 layers of cardboard, it's going to go through most animals. It's not, you know. See, that's how I feel. And the durability, yeah. no, I do believe in that. So I, yeah. you know, I test it through MDF, which is pretty easy to go through. And then maybe that's like a bone. And then steel plate. Okay, that's testing the edge and, you know, hard impact. And then into concrete, we don't, people go, I've never seen a deer with steel plate around. I'm like, ha, ha, ha. Like, they all think they're the first one to come up with that joke. And I understand that. But like you said, one, if a broadhead can make it through all that. Yeah. That's got a better chance than when it falls apart. Like, if everything's equal. I'll take the one that yeah. can hold up to cinder block and, and steel plate. Yeah. Do you know, I like, I worked out actually how to do the proper testing f- consistently, but nobody would ever let you do it. You'd have to go to like buy a whole bunch of pigs that are ready for slaughter or something, basically Ooh. sedate them, have them hanging in a harness side onto you and put, use a hooda shooter. So they're, they're already asleep, right? They're not going to feel any pain. Like, so they're basically already dead. Um, but then you can measure exactly what you need to. I mean, there wouldn't be any adrenaline in them, so that's the only problem about it. But then you would get consistent results. Who to shoot it? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. But, like, can you imagine the animal rights people if we started doing that? <laughs> You'd be shut down. Yeah. Even, you know, an animal dies within 30, after 30 minutes, the penetration is very different. Yeah, in, exactly. In that, the, the meat is different, the viscosity. Yeah. It's, it's hard to come up with a perfect test, but I'll say this. I was going to say the other. So first, if a broadhead can make it through these durable tests that mm-hmm. I do, it's going to be a better chance. It's going to hold together an animal. However, mm-hmm. I've had heads that do very well into concrete. Then you shoot them into an animal and hitting a femur at an angle. Man, that puts a whole different stress on the broadhead. I've seen broadheads do well with concrete straight on that really bend terribly 
on an animal. Yeah. And so the tests are not as unrealistic as people think. Like mm-hmm. animals can be brutally hard on a broadhead. Yeah. I've seen the best of the best bend or break on a on an animal at times. So mm. I think there really is a, a point to be made yeah. in, in the durability. Yeah, well, I mean, like in Finland and Scandinavia, you know, it's all like uh, lava bedrock underneath everything. And oh. so, you know what I mean? Like it's uh, it's quite a big thing. Like you're not, the animal won't damage the broadhead, but usually whatever it's stopped on, unfortunately, messes <laughs> it up real bad. And like those Grim Reapers I use, they actually, the, the head was fine, but where it, it was into the insert on the arrow, it was bending in there which is kind of interesting. I don't know if you found that too in those, but I think the Grim Reapers are engineered really well in the head, but the attachment point to, because they're quite long compared to the the thread, you know what I mean? And yes. I kind of feel like there's some leverage issues going on in there, and that's probably kind of what was going on with them, but um, yeah. they didn't hold up to anything past the animal. That's what I'm saying. I see. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So, no, that's cool. Um, right. couple of last questions. Uh, what is your next dream hunt? Oh, you know, I've got, I've got an awe dead hunt, free range in West Texas cool. coming up in October. And yeah. I've always wanted to hunt awe dad. And I'm supposed to be going with Aaron Snyder. I don't know if you know Aaron Snyder. Wow. He's yeah, that would be of awesome. Yeah. yeah. He, he guides there and we've yes. been friends in Colorado when um when kefaru was based in colorado yes and so we did some stuff together we just did a podcast together his 500th awesome. episode three yeah. hours and 40 minutes just talking about broadheads it wow that's awesome me and aaron i love that but yeah anyway so we're gonna go on this odd dead hunt together and then beyond that i don't know i have a buddy who's this is so weird he's like in the royal family in united arab emirates and he's yes. a big time bow hunter and rifle hunter and he's invited me to bow hunt over there i'd be the first american to bow hunt in uae in, in this in this specific species of, anyway so he's he has this ongoing free invitation come anytime you want that's a possibility i've thought about going to northern australia up in in the northern mm-hmm. territory whatever you call it up there yeah, yeah. For, uh, water buffalo and mm-hmm. i thought about new zealand but those <laughs> Yeah, beyond the audit, I haven't figured out yet. Like into 2025, and I know I need to make a decision because you got to plan those things way in advance. Yeah. But I'm kind of torn about what what to do. Mm-hmm. Mm. Well, I mean, if you you got an open invite to New Zealand with me, if you ever want to go one time, you got a, the local guide, and I can take you all the the cheap good spots too. You know, so <laughs> mm, that's appealing. Yeah. I have well, you can... a tarp. But those are hard to get, like in a public place, right? A no, no, they're not. No, I mean, like all the Southern Alps is basically public land. Oh, yeah, it's just getting to them, right? It's pretty oh, you're finding the area. Yeah, so um, it's. I mean, like there's so many of them that are culling them with helicopters there at the moment. Oh my gosh! Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's uh, you know, there's chamois there too, chamois. Yeah, and, and yeah, all that I've seen those. Stuff, so. I have a friend that shot one, but I haven't hunted. Those those aren't as they don't look as cool. Like no. I love that cape and, and the horns of of the tar. Yeah. You just go, dude, you look like a lion cape. That's amazing. I mean, like, you know, I'd love to go ibex hunting, but it it Ooh. starts at about five thousand euros for a hunt, right? And uh, I have shot. Where so do many- they have those? In, in Spain, a lot of lot, there's oh, about four Spain. or five different species of, or maybe more actually. I know there's at least four different species of ibex in Spain, but I've shot so many goats that I could not even imagine spending five grand on it. Like it's just a glorified goat, really. Oh, I'm just, I see. I'm just letting you know, like, yeah, it's it's something that I would have to be a millionaire before I'd even consider <laughs> doing it. Just being honest with you, you know. It's, uh-huh. uh, yeah, but, uh, but man, those look so cool. Are they hard yeah. to get with a bow, like a, a good size one? The tar? In Spain? Oh, the no, Ibex. The, uh, the Ibex. Well, I honestly haven't been on one of those hunts. I know some people that haven't. I've seen the footage, and I think the Ibex in the right areas are pretty used to people. Um, it doesn't look that hard, depending again on the grounds and what Ibex, but from, from what I have seen in the videos I've seen, it's a very achievable hunt. That's mm. that's what I'll say. Yeah. So uh, it's no. I don't think there's any in any high fenced area stuff like that. Um, they have allocated tags for them as well. 
uh, and stuff like that. So it's a it's a regulated species. Um, again, I'm not sure if all four of them are, but I know that at least some of them have allocated tags for them. So, okay. yeah. Mm-hmm. I've thought about a musk ox too in Greenland, but then I, I saw it takes like three days to get yeah. to but the hunting. Again, again, like I've talked to people that do it and they say you can basically just walk up to them and shoot them. Like the, oh, not really? very, yeah, apparently not very smart. Like, oh. um, yeah, I've talked to three different people that do it and they say it's more about the adventure and the trip. To get oh, there. But once you oh, get I them, see. he said, once you get there and you get to them, it's not much of a hunt. They just huddle in a group. You walk up to 20, 30 yards, whatever you want to do, and then shoot them and the hunt's over. Oh, and and that's see. three different people telling me that. No oh, one ever wow. talks about it, but um, yeah, that's, I've just <laughs> yeah, been honest. they spent all that money. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But they're like, no, it wasn't that, that great, you know. So, oh, okay. Yeah. But I mean, it just depends because I, I know we talked about a little bit in the past and I kind of get the feeling like I've hunted in high fence stuff and you know I do everything and especially in Europe like sometimes you have to take the opportunities you've got Um, but I I, my favorite is wild like wild New Zealand hunting stalking and stuff like that you know but much like broadheads like everything I I do with hunting I feel like I have a toolbox and I pull out what I need whether it's a saddle or tree stand or stalking or you know what I mean it's like a broadheads I'll like whitetail, I love saddle hunting whitetail. I think it's so much fun. Mm. I feel like mm. you're playing chess with the animals and moving around. Mm. And, yeah. And Have you tried a saddle yet? I haven't. I'm too old for a saddle, I dude, think. Dude, you're not too I old. Mean, I use a climber, but I, I don't know about a saddle. No. Nah, dude, like, for instance, like, a, you know, a climber is like, I don't know, three times the amount of weight or something. Yeah, they you are. Know, really. And you can climb a ladder, right, to get up to your, your guttering or whatever. You got no problems covering. You'll be fine saddle hunting. And it's more, it's like, I think people don't understand it's more comfortable. It's, it doesn't look comfortable just hanging by your crotch like that. I know, like, but like just... your ass doesn't go to sleep. You don't get sore oh, legs. You're oh. always in a much better position to shoot. You can put the tree between you and the deer all the time. Like I have you, heard that. You yeah, nearly you get. play around. Yeah, and you get about 360 uh, degrees of shooting around the tree. Not all the time, but, you know, most of the time. So, uh, and it just allows you, like, to be more flexible and versatile and it's quieter than a climate well actually mm. you can get up a tree pretty quietly with a climber too but then again you can't get up every tree with a climber with a yeah, saddle you can. You can. yeah it's yeah. got to be straight so, no branches yeah mm, yeah no it's a, it's a great way to hunt and you know you just put everything on your backpack and walk in with your bow basically it's fantastic so especially that's if you're nice. doing traveling you can take around with you so oh that's a good point yeah yeah very very much so well, John, hey, thank you so much, buddy. I really appreciate it. Um, it's been good. And yeah, like I, I hope we do this again because I like to kind of like feel people out and, and kind of open the door in some of the topics. And like I'm someone that overthinks things. So I'll go back and think about our conversations mm. and stuff. And I probably got more questions, you know, down the line that that would be great to, to get your input on. So. Yeah. Oh man, I, I loved it. I love talking at the ATA. I mean, every yeah. time we've communicated, I've really enjoyed it. And I feel really honored to be on your podcast here today. Man, yeah, I, I look to, forward to doing it again anytime. Yeah, yeah definitely. And and again, like if you want to come hunting in Europe, just come and hit me up. We've got like road air and what we've got white tail air too, actually, and stuff. Oh. Um and yeah, and go to New Zealand, just whatever. You feel like, hey, I want to do something different, you know. I got, I got a lot of contacts over here now, so oh, that's <laughs> it should good. be good. That yeah, is good. perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I no appreciate worries. it. Yeah. Hey, have a good rest of your week and a, and a fantastic weekend, dude. Thanks, brother. You too. Take care. All right. Catch you. Right. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Make sure you follow us for more.